Throughout the 1990s, one of the most critically acclaimed and best-selling metal bands in the world was Pantera, and one of the driving forces behind the band's success was guitarist Dimebag Daryl Abbott, who co-founded the band along with his brother, Vinnie Paul. Abbott was born on August 20th, 1966 in Ennis, Texas, to Carolyn and Jerry Abbott. His older brother Vinny had been born two years prior on March 11th, 1964, and the two quickly developed an inseparable bond that would last throughout the rest of Daryl's life. Their father Jerry was a country music producer who had extensive experience within the industry, and this would be the platform off which both Daryl and Vinny would launch their musical ambitions. At a young age, both the Abbots found themselves taking a budding interest in music, and after experimenting around with several different instruments, Daryl settled on the guitar while his brother Vinny took to the drums. Both parents were very supportive of their children's music interests, and honestly good for them because having two preteen boys playing drums and guitar all day sounds like the stuff nightmares are made of. Daryl would practice with his brother for hours at a time, drawing influence from legendary guitarists like Tony Iommi, Jimmy Page, and Eddie Van Halen. Like most people starting off with an instrument, Abbott wasn't very good at first, but that quickly changed as he poured in hours upon hours jamming with his brother. By the age of 14, Daryl had gained some confidence in his abilities and decided to start entering contests. At this point, he was still too young to even drive and competing against people much older than he was, so the odds of him winning didn't seem too great. But not only did he win, he completely blew everyone else out of the water. In fact, he won so many of these contests that eventually venues would stop letting him enter and just make him a judge whenever he showed up. In 1981, Vinny was approached by some of his high school classmates named Terry Glaze, Tommy Bradford, and Donnie Hart to form a band. Vinny agreed on the stipulation that his younger brother Daryl be allowed to join, which the others were reluctant about but eventually agreed to. After floating around several different names, the group eventually settled on Pantera. Abbott took the stage name Diamond Daryl and shared lead guitar duties with Glaze, though it soon became clear who the superior guitarist was and Terry went back to just playing rhythm, eventually leaving guitar duties behind altogether and taking over as lead vocalist when original singer Donnie Hart left the band not long after its formation. Now, this original incarnation of Pantera was a far cry from what the band would eventually become. This was the 1980s after all, and glam metal was all the rage. Groups like Motley Crue and Poison were selling out arenas, and that's the kind of music Pantera initially wanted to create. Vinny and Daryl's father, Jerry, became the band's manager, and under his label they released their first studio album in 1983 called Metal Magic, which received a very cold reception at the time. Not to be deterred by the subpar reviews, the band followed Metal Magic up the very next year with an album called Projects in the Jungle, which did slightly better with critics, but still received lukewarm praise at best. Something else happened in 1984 though that would make a huge impact on Daryl and Vinny and ultimately change the band's trajectory forever. Metallica released their legendary album Ride the Lightning. Not only was Ride the Lightning a smash hit that would go on to be recognized as one of the greatest metal albums of all time, but it would change the way artists viewed the genre forever and mark the beginning of the end for the glam metal scene. It had a much faster and aggressive sound than people were used to, and it was a sound that many fans around the world became infatuated with, including the Abbott brothers. They both decided they wanted to take this heavier sound Metallica had pioneered, which was dubbed thrash metal, and infuse it with the slower paced melodies that were a cornerstone of the blues inspired rock of the 1970s. They had no way of knowing it at the time, but they were actually creating an entire new subgenre of metal. Their next album, 1985's I Am The Night, saw them bring forth a much heavier sound than they had on previous albums, but still nowhere near the level of aggression Metallica had on Ride the Lightning, which was largely due
due to lead singer Terry Glaze's reluctance to embrace the new sound Vinny and Daryl were going for. Glaze was a glam metal purist through and through, and he disagreed with the artistic direction the Abbott brothers were trying to take the band. This resulted in a falling out that saw Terry leave the band at the end of 1985, leaving Pantera without a singer and kind of stuck in limbo. The band would experiment with several different singers, but none of them seemed to fit the musical direction the group wanted to go in. Finally, in 1986, an 18-year-old New Orleans native named Phil Anselmo heard Pantera was looking for a singer and expressed interest in joining the group. Toward the end of the year, he auditioned, and let's just say the chemistry was obvious from the start. Phil had a powerful voice with a ton of range that fit what the band was going for, and he got along great with the other members. This resulted in him being hired as the new vocalist almost immediately, a position he would maintain until the band broke up in 2003. With a new singer secured, Pantera immediately began working on their fourth album, Power Metal, which released in 1988. This album is unique in that it marks the band standing at a sort of crossroads in their career. On one hand, they were still holding on to that 80s glam sound, but on the other, it was clear they were now firmly drifting in a new direction. Soon, that new direction would emerge for the world to see, and propel Pantera from a niche southern hair metal band into superstardom. After the release of Power Metal, Pantera took a hard look at whether or not they wanted to maintain the hair metal image they had been rocking for almost a decade. The winds of the music scene seemed to be changing, with thrash metal bands like Metallica, Slayer, and Megadeth enjoying mainstream success. This coupled with the band's desire to move in a heavier direction convinced them it was a good time to ditch the spandex and hairspray for ripped jeans and t-shirts. It was at this time that Daryl changed his stage name from Diamond Daryl to Dimebag Daryl, which of course is a reference to a bag of dimes that you take to a bank when you want to deposit them. In a very admirable move, Jerry Abbott stepped down as the band's manager, realizing that if his sons were to achieve their dreams of being rock stars, they would need someone managing them who understood that music scene better than he did. Their new manager was a man named Walter O'Brien who worked for Concrete Marketing, and he would remain their manager for the rest of the band's existence. His first order of business was to try and get Pantera signed to a record label, which proved a surprisingly tough sell as the band was turned down multiple times. Eventually though, they caught the eye of two representatives from Atco Records who immediately looked to sign them to a record deal. The group accepted, and in 1989, began working with famed producer Terry Date on their fifth studio album titled Cowboys From Hell, which released in 1990. They say third time's a charm, but in Pantera's case it was the fifth time's a charm, as Cowboys was a smash hit. The band had basically hit the reset button, coming out with a brand new style both in look and sound. The subject matter of the songs was darker, the music was heavier than anything the group had done before, and their new look more closely resembled a biker gang than the glam rock act they had been just a few years prior. It is considered by many to be one of the greatest metal albums ever made, and is looked upon by most fans as the quote unquote real debut of Pantera. In addition to the harder, edgier vocals from Phil and the louder, faster drums from Vinny, Dimebag's shredding guitar skills were on full display. After years of experimentation, Daryl had finally succeeded in blending the fast pace of thrash metal with the smooth bluesy rhythms of 70s rock, in a new style that would go on to be named groove metal. Now, despite what this video may have led you to believe so far, this is not a music channel, and I honestly would make myself sound like an idiot if I tried to go into detail here about the ins and outs of Pantera's sound. So, for those of you curious about this, I would direct you to Rick Beato, a man who is infinitely more qualified to talk about music than I am, and the video he made about the band. A link will be available in the description and the upper right hand corner. To support the album's release, Pantera kicked off a massive two year tour with nearly 200 stops, and would go on to tour for most of the 1990s. 
Dimebag was often accompanied on the road by his longtime girlfriend, Rita Haney, who he'd been in a relationship with since 1984. But despite being a certified rock star at this point, he never let the success go to his head. Dimebag was always gracious and appreciative of his fans. He would often take the time to sign autographs and pose for pictures with them, which in retrospect makes the fate he would meet years later all the more tragic. Throughout the rest of the 90s, the band would continue its grueling slate of tours, only stopping to record new material, such as their 1992 album Vulgar Display of Power and the 1994 album Far Beyond Driven. Like most rock stars, Pantera partied pretty heavily while on tour, with Daryl being known as a very heavy drinker. His drink of choice, of course, being the now infamous Black Tooth Grin, a drink invented by Dimebag that is a blend of Crown Royal, Seagram 7, and the tiniest little bit of coke just to give it its trademark dark color. So basically it was a shit ton of whiskey with a drop of soda. These years would prove to be Pantera in their prime, with all the albums released in that span receiving critical acclaim and commercial success. The personal relationship between the band members was also at an all-time high, with an almost brotherly bond between them all that seemed unbreakable. Sadly, as with many famous bands throughout history, this wouldn't last. When Pantera returned to the road in 1995, the band members noticed Phil was acting a bit different. He was distancing himself from the others and would often spend his time alone instead of partying with the guys like he had so often done in the past. The rest of the band originally wrote this off as Phil letting his rock star status go to his head, but the reality was much darker than they could have imagined. The year prior, Anselmo had been diagnosed with a back injury that had been caused by the extreme physical exertion he would put himself through performing on stage. Doctors told him he could get corrective surgery if he wanted, but this would result in him being unable to perform for possibly a year or more, something Phil was adamantly against. So instead, he took the much less productive path of self-medication, initially with alcohol and eventually moving on to heroin, which may have helped ease his back pain but resulted in the not-so-insignificant side effect of becoming a heroin addict. Anselmo's addiction came to a head in 1996, when he overdosed after a show in Texas, and his heart stopped beating for five minutes before he was eventually resuscitated. This incident revealed Phil's addiction to the rest of his bandmates, who were completely blindsided by it since the singer had gone through such great lengths to hide what was going on. Dimebag's girlfriend Rita Haney said that Vinny and Daryl were embarrassed by Anselmo's actions, and this this incident formed a rift between the Abbott brothers and Phil. Despite these problems, the band continued touring together for the remainder of the 1990s, but the tensions between Phil and the Abbott brothers only seemed to grow. In addition to his drug problem, Anselmo was known to say outrageous things on stage that would often draw negative attention to the band, something he still seems to have a problem with to this day. Dimebag, Vinny, and bassist Rex Brown very much didn't appreciate this, as they wanted Pantera to be known more for their music rather than controversy. Additionally, Phil began taking long breaks from the group and focusing more of his energy into side projects, such as the band's Down and Super Joint Ritual. At first, the other band members were fine with this, as Anselmo was capable of balancing these side projects with his responsibilities to Pantera. But as the 90s wore on, that became less and less the case. It became very common for Phil to take long breaks from the band, and while they still managed to maintain a robust touring schedule, it was harder for them to get Phil to sit down and make new music, something that bugged Vinny and Dimebag immensely. For their 1996 album, The Great Southern Trend Kill, Anselmo actually recorded his vocals separate from the rest of the band at Trent Reznor's studio in New Orleans, and it would be four years before Pantera released another album, 2000's Reinventing the Steel, which would prove to be their 
their final studio release. They would continue to tour for the remainder of 2000 into 2001, and would play their last show together at Yokohama, Japan on August 28, 2001. A few weeks later, the September 11th attacks took place, and according to Vinny, Phil contacted him in the aftermath and indicated that he wanted to take a break from touring for a while. This was something Vinny and Dimebag agreed upon. However, despite saying this, Anselmo would continue to tour with Super Joint Ritual and Down just as rigorously as he had with Pantera, and was even joined in Down by bassist Rex Brown. Anselmo later stated, though, this wasn't how things happened, and described his version of the conversation as more of a mutually agreed upon hiatus. Regardless of who's right here, the whole ordeal left a sour taste in the Abbott brothers' mouths, but they still held out hope that eventually Phil would rejoin them. Unfortunately, that never happened, and in 2003 it was announced that Pantera had officially broken up. Following the band's breakup, Dimebag was heartbroken and very dejected. He had poured his soul into this group for over 20 years, and felt completely blindsided by their separation. To add salt to the wound, the relationship between him and his once good friend Phil and Selmo had deteriorated drastically following the band's breakup. This soon turned ugly as Anselmo would often make public statements hurling insults at Dimebag and Vinny, as well as blaming them for Pantera's breakup, which inevitably divided the fanbase over who was at fault. Initially, the Abbott brothers considered trying to reform the band with a new singer, but given Phil's attitude toward them at the time, they thought it was very likely this would result in a lengthy legal battle over who had the rights to the Pantera brand. So instead, they decided the best direction would be to start a new group entirely. They recruited former Halford frontman Patrick Lockman as the vocalist, as well as bassist Robert Kakaha, who had the ridiculously cool stage name of Bobzilla, and eventually settled on the name Damage Plan. Between August of 2003 and January of 2004, the group recorded songs for their debut album titled Newfound Power, which was released in February of 2004. It featured several prominent artists such as Slipknot singer Corey Taylor and Ozzy Osbourne's guitarist Zach Wilde, but got a very cold reception from critics and didn't make much of a splash commercially. As disappointing as this was for Dimebag and Vinny, they were happy just to be making music again, and even more happy to be going back on tour, which kicked off not long after Newfound Power's release. The venues they played at were a far cry from the sold out stadiums they found themselves in just a decade ago, but for Dimebag this didn't matter, as for him it was all about the love of the music. Tragically, this love of performing and the love he had for the millions of fans he'd gained over the years would be the very thing that killed him. Nathan Gale was a native of Marysville, Ohio, who had what one would call a troubled life. Gale had suffered from several mental health issues from the time he was a young child, and was enrolled in special education during his time in grade school. And these symptoms only got worse as he got older, earning him the not-so-affectionate nickname of Crazy Nate from his friends. Nathan began listening to Pantera in high school, when a friend loaned him a copy of Vulgar's Splay of Power. Nathan would often listen to it over and over and over again. In fact, for about two years, straight, it was all he would listen to. Inspired by the album, Gale began to write music himself, but according to those who knew him, could never muster up the courage to actually sing the lyrics out loud, even when his friends encouraged him to. Nathan's fanaticism for the band quickly turned from obsessive to outright bizarre. He would tell friends that he befriended the group at a show and that they agreed to come play a concert for him at a friend's birthday party, and the reason and he knew this was hidden messages inside of the CD sleeve. These delusions became even more surreal, as Gale would later start complaining that Pantera had stole lyrics and guitar riffs from him, and that he was in the process of suing the group. He eventually took this yet one step further, and told people the band was trying to steal his identity. After high school, Nathan enlisted in the United States Marine Corps, 
but was discharged only a year after enlisting due to military psychiatrists diagnosing him with schizophrenia. He was given medication for his ailment and moved back home to Ohio where he got a job as a mechanic, though his obsession with Pantera never ceased. By 2004, his friends had begun to distance themselves from him due to his ever-increasing bizarre behavior. It was believed he had stopped taking his medication around this time, and as a result, he had become more unstable than he'd ever been. In the months leading up to December 2004, they said Nate would often rock back and forth and talk to himself, and had even begun talking to an imaginary dog that he believed was with him all the time. He also continued to maintain that the lyrics on Vulgar Display of Power had been written by him and that he was owed money by Pantera. Despite this disturbing behavior, Gale was thought to be harmless by those who knew him. He was weird and uncomfortable to be around, but apart Apart from the occasional angry outburst, he had never gone so far as to harm anyone. On December 8th, 2004 though, that would all change. Damage Plan was making an appearance at the El Rosa Villa nightclub in Columbus, Ohio. It was a small venue that wouldn't have drawn someone like Dimebag Daryl during the height of Pantera's popularity. But for him and Vinny, it was the perfect kind of venue to play in. A small little hole in the wall where they got to be right near the fans was just the kind of thing Daryl loved. Unbeknownst to him at the time, Nathan Gale was waiting outside hoping to catch Dimebag as he was coming off the band's tour bus. In his pocket was a loaded Beretta 9mm, which he'd intended to use to finally take vengeance on the members of Pantera who, in his mind, had stolen his song lyrics and were continuing to try and steal his identity. Months earlier, he had rushed the stage at a Damage Plan show in Cincinnati, Ohio, but was stopped by security before he could get close to the band. He was unarmed, and apart from kicking over some musical equipment as security removed him from the building hadn't caused any harm, so the incident was barely a blip on the group's radar. Nathan's plan this time around was to ambush Vinny and Dimebag as they came off the tour bus, under the guise of a fan asking for an autograph, much like Mark David Chapman had done to John Lennon on the exact same day 24 years earlier. He was too late, however, as the band had already gone inside and began setting up for their show. Nathan decided to change his plan and waited outside while the opening acts performed. During this time, the club's security took notice of him hanging around, but wrote him off as a straggler just trying to get into the show without a ticket. As Damage Plan took to the stage and began their introductions, Gale scaled a wooden fence around the back of the club and made his way into a side door that was unlocked and started walking towards the stage. Security spotted him immediately and began following him, but didn't view it as an emergency as they were still assuming he just wanted to sneak into the show without paying. Suddenly, as Damage Plan began playing their first song of their set list, Nathan rushed the stage and pulled the pistol out of his coat pocket. Before anyone realized what was going on, he ran up to Dimebag and fired four shots into his former hero. Three of them struck Daryl in the head and a fourth went through his hand. He collapsed on the floor and died instantly at the age of 38. Initially, the crowd thought this was some sort of elaborate stunt, and some of them actually cheered. Gale then turned and fired a shot at Damage Plan's tour manager, Chris Paluska, striking him in the chest before the band's head of security, Jeffrey Thompson, rushed Nathan and tackled him. During the struggle, Thompson was shot three times and would eventually die of his wounds. By this point, a full-blown panic had started amongst the audience, as Patrick Lockman screamed into the mic for someone to call 911 and jumped off stage to escape the shooter. A club employee had ran out of a rear exit when the first shots were fired and placed a call to 911 from a nearby payphone. Police rushed to arrive on scene, but inside the chaos continued. Gail stood up and realized during his melee with Thompson he had lost his glasses, making it harder for him to see. At this point, a fan attending the show named Nathan Bray had jumped on stage and was attempting to help the fatally wounded Dimebag. Gail turned and pointed the gun at him, firing a shot through his chest and killing him. 
after which the gun ran out of ammunition. As he fumbled around to reload, a club employee by the name of Aaron Halk attempted to subdue the much larger Gale, and was shot six times, which killed him instantly. A stagehand named John Brooks then rushed Nathan and was shot twice in the leg before being taken hostage. As all this was happening, Ohio police had rushed the building, including Officer James Nagemeyer, who made his way into the club through a rear entrance armed with a Remington 12-gauge shotgun. Sneaking up behind them and realizing he had the element of surprise and that another life would likely be lost if he didn't act, the officer took aim at Gale from behind Vinnie Paul's drum set and fired a shot through Nathan's face, killing him instantly. In total, the entire incident lasted just under five minutes. Five minutes that felt like an eternity for those involved. By the end, five people, including the killer, lay dead, and a legion of fans who adored Dimebag would be asking why. In the immediate aftermath of the shooting, many speculated that Gale's motivation was anger at Dimebag for Pantera's breakup. This started largely because of a rumor that when Nathan had pulled out his gun, he screamed this is for breaking up Pantera before shooting Daryl. However, this was refuted by people who attended the show, as they said it was impossible to hear anything Gale might have said due to how loud the music was. Also, just a few weeks prior to the shooting, Phil Anselmo had done an interview with the magazine Metal Hammer, in which he stated that Abbott needed to be, quote, beaten severely. This caused many in Dimebag's inner circle to hold a grudge against Phil for several years, including Vinny, who refused to speak to Anselmo for the rest of his life. Rita Haney also went so far as to say she would, quote, blow Phil's brains out if he tried to attend Dimebag's funeral. Though, unlike Vinny, she seems to have reconciled with Anselmo in the years since. As far as the official investigation was concerned, no connection was found between the killing of Daryl and the breakup of Pantera with police stating the only thing they could find as far as motive was Gale's delusional belief that Pantera had stolen his lyrics and were attempting to steal his identity. Tributes came pouring in from across the globe for the fallen guitar icon, with many fans making the journey to Ohio over the next several weeks to pay homage out front of the club where Daryl had been killed. Thousands more attended the public memorial held in his honor, and Dimebag was buried in a casket decorated in KISS iconography, which was donated by Gene Simmons. He was laid to rest in a plot next to his mother, who had died of cancer in 1999. A couple of months prior to his murder, Daryl had fulfilled a lifelong dream of finally meeting his hero, Eddie Van Halen and asked if he could get a replica of the famous black and yellow striped guitar Eddie would often play. In a moving tribute to the fallen guitarist, Eddie took the original guitar and had it placed in Daryl's casket, remarking, quote, Dimebag was an original, and only an original deserves the original. To this day, Dimebag Daryl is recognized as one of the greatest metal guitarists of all time, whose music still inspires artists across the world. And while he may no longer be with us, his legend will live on forever. If you are interested in true crime, criminal justice history, or mysterious stories from around the world, consider subscribing so you can be updated whenever we post something new. If you want to support the channel and get behind the scenes access to our videos, as well as a production credit, feel free to sign up on our Patreon page. A link will be available in the description and on our channel. This is Crime Spot, and thank you for watching.